Joe, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time, my man. Yeah, of course. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. So I figured we'd start things off with you making fun of your brother for being on YouTube. And now here you are on YouTube. What has that transition been like going from looking at him and, and kind of giving him some shit and then to now actually doing what he was doing way back when? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, so I have for, for the listeners who don't uh, have any background on me, I have four brothers, right? So as you can imagine, growing up in a household like that, we like to, uh, for better, better or worse terms, bust each other's balls, right? So it's like, I don't like, we just like that fun. And, and I think that was kind of like the running joke. Uh, two of my brothers, my youngest brother, John, he's kind of gotten on the internet recently and he's been tweeting and doing kind of some of that stuff. Anthony obviously has a large public profile and I've started to build mine also. But then we have two brothers, uh, Vincent and Michael, who aren't online. Uh, I think they, they probably have Twitter accounts, but they're either anonymous or, or just private or whatever, but they don't, uh, you know, they don't engage or, or try to build the following. So their whole thing was always, hey, you guys are messing around on YouTube. That's not real work, all this stuff, right? <laughs> so, uh, probably 99% of a joke, 1% true, but, you know, it was just always something that we, uh, we like to mess around with. So was that actually a part of your hesitancy to put yourself out there online or was there any hesitancy at all from your perspective? No, I think, um, the hesitancy probably was just if there was any there. Yeah, there's certainly some there, but I think it's more of just like, uh, you know, are people going to care what I have to say? Is it true? Is it, am I any good at this? Do I have stuff people want to, uh, read or listen to or talk about? So I think it's kind of all the same natural stuff that I'm sure you and other people all go through when they, when they start something, uh, kind of in public, right. When you start tweeting, when you start writing, when you start publishing a podcast, I think it's all kind of those same, uh, emotions, having someone that had already done it, I actually thought was helpful, right. Not only from a, Hey, look, uh, they have an audience, they have this platform, all this of stuff but just from simple things like advice is this how you would do this is uh you know seeing someone go through it and, and you, st you you start to realize very quickly um that no matter what you do you could i've tweeted out the most positive things imaginable and there's always people that come back and uh we'll, we'll have an issue with it right and say why don't you do this way and and uh, so once you realize that pretty early on you kind of get a lot more comfortable i think and and as your audience grows and it becomes more obvious and that never goes away it certainly i'm sure the uh the most positive people in the world that have the most loyal following still get it uh but I, uh, I, I always, we always refer to internally kind of this quote from, I think it's Joe Rogan who says, like, just don't look at the comments, right? Because uh, if they're really good, your head will get really big. And if they're really terrible, you'll just feel like shit. And neither, neither of those solutions or outcomes are really good. Uh, so it's not that I certainly do. I just certainly do read the comments from, uh, from time to time and interact with people and do stuff like that. But I think just the idea of like, hey, look, there's always going to be people that don't like what you're doing, don't respect what you're doing, give you a hard time, don't agree with you. And, and they'll still follow you and they'll still comment every time and say, hey, you're an idiot. Uh, but just knowing that and understanding that I think goes a long way. You mentioned before that you ask for advice for some particular things when you're just getting started. What types of things did you ask advice for? Yeah. I mean, I think there's, uh, there's probably like, uh, obvious things like, Hey, is this how you would structure this? Is this a good thing to tweet out? Uh, what time should I do this at? Uh, is this the right way to phrase it? You know, just like little things like that. I think having someone to kind of, uh, lean on, whether it's my brother or my girlfriend, other people, right. I think, uh, those are things that I've always kind of relied on, whether it's online or in personal life. And then there's, um, you know, there's just things that someone who's done something before, right. I, I, I don't know this the straight up piece of advice, but everyone always says, Hey, look, if you're looking to accomplish something, go to someone who's already done it because they can help you out. They can tell you how to do it, all that type of stuff. So it's the same concept kind of, uh, internally in our family, right? It's like, Hey, look, we're all kind of building these audiences together. Um, everyone has, you know, different experiences, but at the same time, we can all leverage each other's kind of knowledge and experience and all that type of stuff to help each other out. Yeah. So how exact you started what in August of 2020, was that when you started putting out content? I think, I think uh, July, yeah. Okay, so July of 2020. Now we're sitting in June of 2021. I'm curious, going back to July of 2020, how exactly did you measure success a year from when you started? And has the success been more than you expected? Is this what exactly what you expected? Talk to me about reflecting on that journey. Um, yeah, like, it's been crazy, man. Like I just, uh, I, 
I certainly measure, I would say that on some scale, I measure it the exact same today as I did then. And then on some scales, I measure it completely different. So what I mean by that is like, when I first um, started writing, I had a sub stack for months and I didn't write a single thing. So if you look at my chart, it goes like this forever. And then all of a sudden it's like, eh, and it goes like really, really, really slow. And then like, it goes bigger, right? So I think part of it was just getting started. So there was always kind of like this desire to do something like that and kind of put myself out there and then just really just pushing myself over the edge. Um, but at first, right, like I think everyone does it. You, you see it and you're like counting the number of subscribers. You're like, oh, one more added today, two more added today, three more added. Like, did this person sign up? I told them about it. They should sign up, right? And you just start to, uh, you know, you're like very meticulous over kind of the details at first. And some of that goes away. Uh, but I'm certainly, I, I'm still meticulous over it, right? Like I, I check every day the number of subscribers. I check people who unsubscribe. I check the open rate. I check kind of click-throughs. I check all that that stuff right and i think it's um i think that probably will never go away maybe to some scale i'm not as uh as kind of detailed about it as i was but i certainly still check all that but yeah it's gone um much better than i i expected i think uh i had some goals in mind when i first started and they were just um looking back now they were just minuscule kind of compared to where i've gotten and all that type of stuff and i don't think it was necessarily um i think it was a couple of things probably there was some lack of of confidence, not because I didn't believe that I had the intelligence or the ability to do it, uh, but just I had never done it, right? So you, you, I think naturally kind of when you start something new or you're, you know, doing something that you're not experienced in, you probably have some type of kind of uh, consciously, conscious belief that you're, you're unable to do it, right? So I think that was probably part of it. Um, and then over time, like that just naturally goes away. So I, I saw things start to compound and, and the sayings are true, right? Like just doing it every single day, it helps. And I was, my, my newsletters Monday through Friday, I try to get out, you know, a number of tweets during the day, everything compounds on each other. I do podcasts like this. I, I, I do a bunch of other stuff and it's just kind of like over time, maybe, you know, some weeks are great. Some are terrible. Some days are great. Some days are individual days are terrible, but when you start to uh, kind of just stack the good ones on top. We're almost a year over now, and uh, I'm at almost 250k on on Twitter and and 40 something on the newsletter. So it's uh, it's been incredible. So what were those early goals, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, I think uh, I wanted to have 10,000 on the newsletter by uh, 12 months. I think was the, the original goal. Um, so we're kind of like 4x that now, over 4x that, which is which is great. Um, and then I don't even know what Twitter was. I want to say Twitter was like, tw I, I, I don't even want to say the Twitter number. The Twitter number was stupid. It was so small compared to kind of where I've gotten now. Um, but, but to be honest, like I just, uh, I get, as you can imagine, right. You're, you're kind of in this creator space and, and building your podcast and doing these same things. And I always get asked, uh, one similar kind of piece. Everyone wants to know what's like the one thing that was the biggest kind of help or attributing factor to you growing. And, uh, I, I always just say like, I was just lucky enough to find one thing that worked really well. And I just doubled down on it really hard, which were those, uh, I do a bunch of Twitter threads, right? So I knew coming in that I had one inherent advantage, which was my brother had a large online audience. He had 250, maybe 300,000 followers at the time. And his has grown and scaled up really well at the same time uh, as mine has. But I knew originally, right? Like you need two things to really be successful and it's really good content and then large distribution. And you need to, if you don't have that distribution, you need to find it somehow, whether it's DMing people on Twitter, whether it's kind of reaching out to people, whether it's just scaling up over time or whatever it might be. Uh, but I knew I kind of had help in that place, right? And, and retweets help. They don't, I think they're probably a little less helpful than everyone thinks they are uh, on some degree, but if you have good content, they can be extremely helpful. So I knew that if I could kind of ace the content piece that it would go really well. So I was writing these newsletters and the first couple I wrote, I was writing for, uh, most people don't realize this by the way, my newsletter started out as I was just sharing links to an interesting article a day that I thought was cool. And um, looking back now, it's just completely different from what it's kind of turned into. Uh, but it's just funny because I think I certainly did, and I'm sure other people do, but I stressed really hard over everything being perfect when I first started, right? Like I wanted, I wouldn't launch it. I wouldn't send one out unless the logo was right. I wouldn't do it if uh, I didn't have three people read it before and tell me it was good, right? And looking back now, it's just not even considerably close to what it's become. But I think um, I say that because what I started to do was I was writing these newsletters and one day I was like, hey, why don't I you know, basically just take the newsletter that I wrote today and put it in a thread and tweet it out. And anyone who's not subscribed and if my brother can retweet it, they'll see it. And maybe they'll say, Hey, I like this and I'll subscribe. Uh, and the first one probably got a hundred likes, 200 likes, 300 likes, something like that. Right. Which is, which is, was amazing to me when I first started, it was amazing. And I got, you know, 
30 signups, 40 signups. And that was more than I had at the time. So I was like, this is fantastic. Right. And I'd already kind of run through the family and friends and maybe I had a couple hundred, but I was getting 30, 40 when I did that. So it was, it was great. And I, uh, I was like, okay, so this is clearly kind of, I did one and then I did a second one a couple of days later. And I was like, okay, this is working again. And then I did a third and it worked again. And then I sat down and I was like, Hey, look, this is by far and away the best kind of growth channel that I had. And, and to be fair, this was, two months in, maybe a month in me doing it, right? So I hadn't tried everything. I had done message boards, right? I'd been spamming people. I'd been doing all those kind of things to uh, just hustle. But I think once I found that out, I was like, all right, the easiest way to scale this is just do it every day. So every single day for like six months, maybe maybe four to five days a week, right? So some weeks, maybe there were four, most weeks five, but uh, for six months, I did a threat, right? And some days it was the newsletter. Some days it was a different story. Some got 200 likes, some got 45,000 likes, right? And it just, they compounded over time, right? And it's just like some hit, some didn't, but if I was just consistently doing it every single day, I knew that over time, the list would continue to grow and the following would continue to grow. And it has, and it's worked really well. How do you figure out exactly what to write about on any specific given day? Uh, I get asked that question a lot too. And I don't think there's like a, a golden answer. I, I, I basically, what I do is I just search a bunch of different sites. I'm very uh, kind of in tune with what's happening throughout the day, topics over time. So I have like a running list of ideas. Uh, some are like longer term in nature, things that require a lot of research. And then some are things that I could probably do tomorrow if I really wanted to. Um, and then occasionally I'll knock a couple of those things off and then I'll mix it in with kind of some current events, right? So if, uh, one example would be like the Minnesota Timberwolves a couple of weeks, they got sold or, you know, they had an agreement in principle to get sold to Mark Lohr and Alex Rodriguez. So that's like something that's very uh, on topic. People want to read about it and talk about it and all that kind of stuff. So I'll write about things like that, that come up. Uh, but don't get me wrong. There's certainly days where I'm like, you know, shit, this is a daily newsletter. I got to go find something to write about. And uh, there's very late nights, very early mornings. Um, and, and that's, a, I think another very, common misconception is that I have these things done like days in advance and they're ready to go. Uh, and that, that is certainly not the case. There's, there's times where that is the case. And then there's a lot of times where it isn't, where I'm kind of, uh, waking up and writing and doing different things to, to make sure I get it out. Um, but the daily things are grind, but I think it's helpful. It's, you know, keep keeping mind share with everyone every single day. You just got a bunch of shot on goals, right? So you can not only from uh, kind of monetizing it through an advertising perspective, you can do five ads a week instead of one or whatever, but uh, you're in every, you're in people's inbox every single day, right? So they see your name, they, 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 they feel like that connection is a little deeper than maybe once a week. Um, and it's, it's a lot of effort, but I think people appreciate kind of that daily nature of it. I know you mentioned that quarantine was really when you started taking inventory of your life and realizing that you didn't want to go down the route that you were previously going down. I'm curious, was there a specific moment where you stopped and said, I can't do this anymore. I got to go a different route. Or was it more of a gradual process? Yeah, I think it was gradual to be honest. Like there's, I think everyone has good and bad days. Right. So like I, for the people that don't know, I was at JP Morgan previously. Um, and right. Like that's an excellent job. I was super, 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 super happy when I got it. Um, I, I didn't see myself doing that in the short amount of time that I was able to get it out of school and all this stuff. And, um, I was just, I was really happy to be there. And then when I got there, I was like, eh, this probably isn't exactly what I wanted to do. Right. And I really mean that from, um, the, the aspect of, I didn't see myself doing it when I was 45 or 50 or 60. Right. And you start to look at these guys that are coming into work every single day in New York city and they're commuting an hour and a half in and they're doing the same thing every day for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, it's uh, rewarding and it's challenging and it's all those things. It, it checks a lot of the boxes, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do long term. And I think when I started to see that day after day after day, it was like, okay, uh, maybe this isn't exactly what I want to do. And then when quarantine came up, it was just like the perfect opportunity, right? Like it was just kind of like, I'm at home. I have a little more free time. There's no kind of commuting. Uh, I have more personal time. I can work on this when I can. There's, you know, just, there's a little more urgency to kind of get something going. Um, and then when I started, I was, I was probably writing the newsletter and tweeting for, I think I left my job in September. So a few months, right. Uh, July, August, September. Yeah. So three months. And, uh, basically when I started and I saw that it was working and I was like, okay, the newsletter, maybe I had like 
5,000, 6,000, 7,000 subscribers or whatever, maybe 10, 15, 20 on Twitter. But I could see that it was, it was working. And it was one of those things like, look, dude, I, I was thinking to myself, Hey, I'm 26 years old. If I do this for five, 10, 15 years, like this is just going to keep compounding. If these are the results now, like just put in the work and it will go. Um, so once I figured that out, it was like, okay, how can I start doing this full time? And uh, that, that was really the big shift for me was just kind of being able to do it all day long, right? And, and getting rid of uh, kind of, I was doing both jobs, probably not to the level that I wanted to personally. Um, I, I don't think the people at JP Morgan, uh, they certainly didn't have any issues with it. There was no problems or anything like that, but it was just kind of like the level and the quality of work that you want to put up for yourself probably didn't match uh, kind of what was going on when you're trying to do two different jobs, right? So I'd wake up at 5 a.m. to write the newsletter, 5.30 a.m. to write the newsletter. Then you got to do it at night. You're trying to get a couple of tweets out during the day and follow the news and talk about things. And then you got to do your full job that usually requires 60, 70 hours of work on a normal week. So it's kind of like, it's just, it was, it was a lot. So uh, that was my main focus after kind of a month or two. Uh, and lucky enough for me, look, I was in a good situation where I was able to find kind of a, an exclusive sponsor and uh, monetize it pretty quickly and, and get out the door and, and be able to start build this thing. And that's where you kind of saw the graph go from, hey, kind of slow and steady to kind of start to go uh, north a lot quicker. And I think that was kind of like a super, uh, not only a transitional point, but super helpful point in kind of building the business. How do you figure out exactly when's the right time to quit your normal job? Um, I don't know. I think it's different for everyone. Right. And I think, so my, my, I'll tell you my thought process and people can kind of take it for, uh, what they want. And I haven't done research on this. I haven't talked to a million people or whatever. So this is just solely my opinion and my experience. And, uh, if it's helpful for people, if that's great. If it's not, that's great too. So my whole thought process on it, on it was once I was able to find an advertiser, uh, I went to a bunch of people and I was like, Hey, look, uh, these are my growth rates. I showed them everything. This is kind of where I think I'll be, whatever. Uh, I wanted to find someone that was long enough term deal where I felt comfortable enough to leave my job. So I was like, let's do a six month deal. Uh, I just want to make similar to what I'm making kind of on a salary basis um, per month. And then um, I think you'll get, a, I think I was very honest and open and clear. And I was like, Hey, look, I think uh, I'll probably get a good deal for the first two to three months to be completely honest. I think I'll get a good deal uh, based on relative what you're going to pay me, where my audience size is right now and all this type of stuff. And then I think you're going to get a really good deal in the last three to four months because my audience is going to continue to grow. The amount you're paying me is not going to be relative to what I could go charge other advertisers if it continues to grow at the rate that I think it will. So um, I was lucky enough to link up with the guys at Athletic Brewing who had been following me and believed in it and really liked what I was doing. And, and really they were just, um, it was more so, it wasn't even necessarily a, hey, look, we're looking for this multiple on return on ad spend and we want these numbers to match up and we want adults. Those dudes are just great. They just were like, hey, look, we love what you're doing. Uh, we think it makes sense from a money standpoint. Like, let's do it. We want to support you. We want to do it. Whatever. Let's go do it. So, and, and at the end of the day, I was like, look, guys, like, I'm going to be doing this for a long time, hopefully. Uh, so one, I won't forget it. Two, uh, I'm going to make sure you tell me exactly how many fucking non-alcoholic beers you need to sell and I'll make sure it gets done, right? So that, that whole kind of like, not only I would say there was certainly a, a, a level of confidence myself to make sure it was able to be done, uh, but just like their willingness and their ability to kind of help out an entrepreneur, right? I think was extremely helpful. So once I got uh, kind of transitioning back to your original question, which was how I knew it was the right time to leave. When I thought back to myself and I'm like, okay, now I got someone who's willing to match what I'm willing to do. People leave their job on a hell of a lot less than that, right? So I was like, all right, if I don't do this, like I'm an idiot. So um, I, I just kind of thought about it like, okay, look, they're going to match what I'm doing. It's going to give me six months of runway to be able to kind of go for this. Uh, if I fuck up, I'm 26 years old. I'll either go back to work at JB Morgan, I'll go find a different job or I'll keep trying, right? And it wasn't a standpoint where like I was going to be sleeping on the street. So that's where I mean like everyone's uh, situation is different. I had some money saved up. I was fine. I was, you know, going to be okay regardless. Uh, so when I thought of kind of all those different pros and cons, it was a no brainer for me. What have your friends and family said about it? Obviously your family is kind of familiar with the whole thing, but what about your friends who have, who probably haven't seen anyone do this before? Yeah, it's, it's funny. Uh, you're, you're right. I don't think a lot of friends have seen people kind of doing uh, similar stuff in, in building, uh, you know, businesses and media platforms and content creation, and all that type of stuff. So I think at first it was the level of a little bit of uh, shock and kind of like, Hey, what's this guy doing? Uh, but 
you know, I, the one thing I always think about is like, I've, I've kind of thought about it consciously for a long time. It's like, if you just don't give a shit what anyone thinks about it, then there's nothing to worry about. Right. And, uh, I think that was extremely, extremely helpful when I first started, um, because there was people that I was close with that didn't sign up for the newsletter. And I'm like, Hey, you know, like, come on, man. Like, don't you want to see your friends do well and all this stuff? And uh, in the grand scheme of things, it literally doesn't matter at all because it's one person out of whatever. Uh, but yeah, I think it's natural for anyone to feel some type of like, you know, why didn't they do this when you first started and the numbers are low and you're looking for your support and all that kind of stuff. And there's uh, there's been tons of friends that have been extremely helpful and supportive and all that kind of stuff. And I think as I've grown and the platforms have grown and, and uh, I did a podcast with uh, an interview with Gary V the other day and people were like, hey, Gary V. And, and I love <laughs> Gary, but it was just funny because my friends were like, that was like a turning point for them. Like, oh, you're interviewing Gary V. And it's funny. There's There's been a number of things like that or, or sports center reposting things and stuff like that where like, okay, this is slowly turning into something Something that's a little more legit and recognizable and all this stuff and, and I think over time that opinion is probably transferred uh, but I'll tell you I didn't spend I don't think one minute thinking about kind of like what people said side conversations or did like that because it didn't really matter to me to be honest it's so funny that you mentioned Gary V being the turning point for you because I did this podcast for three months interviewed Gary V and all of a sudden I got all this out of the woodwork people I didn't spoke to it for years like whoa Gary V I'm yeah. like yeah, I've been doing this podcast. Yeah. No, but it, it's funny, <laughs> man. Like that that's what happens. Like as soon as you get some cosign from someone at a high level, everyone starts to get it. But the only way you get to that point is if you put yourself out there in the beginning and really yeah. like put in those early reps. So talk to me about, you know, what has surprised you the most? If you were to talk to Joe from last year, what do you think would have surprised him the most about where you are today? Um, it sounds stupid, but just the power of kind of putting yourself out there on the internet, right? Like I've had conversations and, and dinners and, and, uh, just Twitter DMS and phone conversations or whatever in person with people that I wouldn't have even imagined, uh, 12 months ago, right? Like guys that I looked up to from, uh, kind of professional athletes and business people and stuff like that, to, that I just thought were like, when you're not kind of, and keep in mind, I wasn't on, uh, Twitter before this, right? So I didn't have kind of the concept of, hey, maybe if I tweet someone, they'll answer and tag me or DM me or whatever. Uh, but like just that whole idea of like the people that I've been able to get in touch with and have become friends with really and 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 talk to regularly and all this type of stuff. It's just people that I would have uh, never imagined a year ago and uh, seemed kind of like role models and stuff like that and just kind of um, out of reach. So I think that's certainly been surprising to me. Um, as I, as you, uh, kind of grow and some of that things, some of those conversations become, uh, you become numb to them to some degree. I think you, you start to think, Hey, you know, I've had a few of these, they, they this is how it works and all this type of stuff. Uh, but I, every single time I'm still like, this is crazy, man. Like, um, I'm fucking 26 years old. I started writing on the internet and tweeting and all this stuff. And this guy wants to talk to me, like, it's crazy. Um, so I think that's been probably like the biggest thing for me. And then um, secondly, I think it's just like building a personal business and it's, it's tough. It's, uh, it's super, super, super rewarding. I think um, I, 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 I think I probably thought I understood that, but when you, when you feel it and you're kind of in the trenches every day and you're doing different things, whether it's uh, getting new subscribers or closing a sponsorship deal or any of these, they're just super rewarding feelings for a lot of this stuff uh, and a feeling of accomplishment. And then um, I, I think just like the grind of it. I didn't, I, I grew like a whole new level of respect of, or for people like you or, or other people who are not only putting themselves out there, but creating, uh, you know, high quality, consistent content for, for a long period of time. Um, and, and I think you've, you see kind of all the time, different people, they get burnt out or they get tired or they move on to something else where they start doing other things and, and all that type of stuff. Cause it's just hard. And I think, uh, I think I, I gained probably like a level of respect for that, that I didn't probably have beforehand. What's the most difficult part of your day-to-day -day existence nowadays? Um, it's just everything, you know what I mean? It's just like everything <laughs> compounds. So it's like, and I don't mean to be that, say that in like a dramatic fashion. It's just like, when you think about it, you got to get the newsletter out every day, right? You're, you're doing a bunch of different tweets. A million different things come out, to, come up throughout the day. People are reaching out on email, uh, Twitter DMs. And, and I'm the type of guy that I, I like to answer people. You know what I mean? You want to be personable. You want to go out of your way to do certain things. Um, I try to go on different podcasts if I can. I try to do all these different things. And then you got to work out the sponsorships. You got to sign contracts. You got to do invoices. You got to get the ad copy. And I've had some help recently and stuff like that, but I'm 
um, uh, I, I don't think I realized when I first started kind of the level that that stuff would uh, would take on a daily basis. And I, it was, I always refer back to the kind of the saying of like, there's not enough hours in the day. And those, that was one of those sayings that I, you, you hear all the time growing up and other people say it. And when you're in high school or college and you're just goofing around and you're, you're messing around and you don't understand, you're like, oh, there's plenty of time, you know, like I, what do you mean? I was hanging out. I did this, did this. Uh, but as you start to kind of build these businesses and you're doing these different things online and all this stuff, uh, you realize that it's true. It's just like, there's just so many different things that need to be done. And it's figuring out kind of that balance of uh, what's urgent and what needs to be done right now. And then things that can kind of uh, take a backseat and, and be done over time. So I think I've, uh, I've gotten a lot better about that over the last kind of year, but certainly when I started out, that's probably what I struggled with the most. Speaking of urgent, what do you think is the most urgent thing on your day to day? What is the number one needle mover activity? would you say for Joe Pompliano? Um, needle. So I think about that question in two different ways. Urgency is in kind of what needs to be done, right? And uh, what moves the needle is in what needs to be done to help grow the business. So what needs to be done every morning after write a newsletter, right? So that's kind of like my thought process every day is like, one, what am I going to write about two? Let's get it done, right? So like, it's just something that when you put a deadline on it, it's got to get done and you, you just go do it, right? So I think from an urgency perspective, there's easy things to say like that, that, you know, they got to get done. You got to go do it. Just go do it. And then uh, from an urgency perspective, kind of like, how do you think about building a business and stuff? I know that there's, there's certain things, right? Like threads, those move the needle. I get followers, I get subscribers. Those turn into more eyeballs, more advertisers, stuff like that. So those are the things that like you prioritize and you start to realize, oh, I haven't done one in two days. Like, let me do one today make sure it gets done. It needs to be done at a certain time. It needs to be structured, right? It needs to have, you know, there's just, they take a lot of time, right? So there's a bunch of things that go into it. Uh, but from an urgency perspective, I think the key is just focusing on the things that you know, like you said, will move the needle and it's, and it's putting uh, things that may not be as important or whatever on the back burner. So there's things, uh, you know, business structure wise, like, did I sign these documents? Did I set this up correctly? Did I do these payments and all this type of stuff? And there's a bunch of stuff that goes into it as, as you know, when you're kind of building your own content. Uh, but it's just figuring out kind of from an urgency perspective, what needs to be done first. Hmm. So I know your brother just launched the Bitcoin pizza and I'm curious what your future plans, if any, are for some sort of business in the future using the audience to create some sort of business. Is that like a product business? Is that on your mind? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think um, the, the easiest way to think about it is uh, we think of ourselves not as influencers, but entrepreneurs, right? And it's, and it's kind of... Uh, you know, people can laugh or say whatever they want when you think about it. But I always, I laugh personally when I see, I saw an article the other day and I won't name the publication that said it, but it was, it was a sports business publication and they labeled Pat McAfee as an influencer. And I just thought it was hilarious because it's like, at what point does he become an entrepreneur? Cause he's a world-class entrepreneur. He's built a, 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 a hundred million dollar plus business. Right. And it's like, this thing is a behemoth. It's massive. He does a bunch of different things and all this type of stuff. He's not an influencer. An influencer, he's just not an influencer. He built a massive business. So um, I think some people get offended by that. I don't really care about it personally, like a name calling thing. Uh, but I just think it's funny because when you start to think about kind of the life cycle of uh, of someone online who's doing content and all this type of stuff, the key is really, in my opinion, just starting to launch different products and businesses and revenue streams and, and, and really becoming an entrepreneur, right? So uh, I always thought of it as kind of that capacity. So I've done... Uh, I launched an ETF with the guys at Roundhill. So we have this, uh, this ETF called MVP. It lets you invest in professional sports teams, right? And it's not something that uh, is probably like the most genius thing in the world, but there wasn't one out there. It makes money. It does all this stuff. It gives exposure, all this type of stuff. So things like that, I think are cool. Um, and then all this really just plays into the investing side, right? So one of our core beliefs from an audience perspective is like the best investors are going to have large audiences online, whether that's on Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, whatever it is, right? Just like large profiles, newsletters, everything. Um, and, and what that really gives you the ability to do is one, it gives you access to deals, right? People want to be involved with you because you have these audiences. It gives you distribution. Uh, and, and really what that, what that enables you to do is create inflection points for a lot of these businesses. So, right, you have a business, you invest in it, they find product market fit. How can you blast it out to kind of everyone help them with distribution organically and making it meaningful inflection point in their business. And I think that's how we think about it really uh, when, when it comes down to it is kind of like, how can we build products, build businesses, and then invest in other businesses with the cash that we kind of pull off from a content standpoint. Makes sense. So I'm curious, you know, you've combined sports and business and obviously Darren Ravel did that first and is known as like the godfather of that on the internet. 
How much yeah. of you said like, is this space saturated or I'm just going to follow what I'm, what in my heart I know I should be doing? Um, I honestly, maybe it was me just being naive, but I didn't really think about it like that. I thought uh, I was just super passionate about it. And I knew that I was good at it. And it was like something that I was always talking about all the time. And and I, ca- I continuously found myself telling people things they didn't know and just being super interested in things. And like, when you realize that, that just a light switch turns and you're like, okay, like I should probably do something about this. Uh, but like when it comes to Darren, first off, Darren gets a lot of shit on the internet. I love Darren Robel. He's awesome. He's great. He's the man. He's, uh, yeah, he's great. Look, he he has his unique way and his quirks and all that kind of stuff, but he's been unbelievably helpful uh, to me kind of starting out. So uh, I always try to go out of my way whenever someone asks about him to, to just tell people like, dude, he's a great guy. He, he I first started out, I think I had like uh, maybe 100 followers, 200 followers. Like I literally just got on Twitter. It was like a day or two days old. Um, and I said, Hey, I tweeted out like an idiot. And I was like, I'm going to be tweeting about sports business. Follow me. <laughs> my brother was like, go follow him. Darren Ravel follows me. He was one of like my first, like two or 300 followers. And at me, like just starting out, I was like, Holy shit, Darren Ravel just followed me. Uh, and now like we're friends and we talk and all this kind of stuff. And it's, it's funny. Uh, but just like for him to reach out, he retweeted a few of my early tweets that I sent to him and stuff like, like, you know, he's just an unbelievably, uh, kind person. And he was super, super, super helpful getting started out. And not only just from like, a, hey, helping out with the distribution and giving you kind of that legitimacy perspective, but just from a confidence perspective. It's like, hey, look, Darren's, like you said, the godfather of this. If he thinks this thread is good and he's going to retweet it, like it's probably pretty decent and it's accurate and it's good and all that. So I think uh, leaning on guys like him was more helpful than, than I, th- I thought of it as more helpful than I did as of like competition, right? Because Darren's been around forever. Uh, he has his established audience. I think that we, uh, the way I thought about it was like, there's not really someone doing it for a younger generation, right? So I don't know exactly how old Darren is, but he's obviously older um, and and he just has a different audience, right? And it's, and it's, uh, he's done really, really, really well from a kind of a content standpoint and building an audience and building a personal brand and stuff. Uh, So I thought, look, if I can just do this on any kind of scale relative to what he's done for a younger generation, it's going to go pretty well. And, and like I said, credit to him, he was, uh, he didn't necessarily see it as competition either. I don't think he was more helpful than hurtful. Um, and, and that went a long way with me. Yeah. Win and help win is what it seems like he did for you. And obviously your brother did the same thing, basically free distribution, free retweets. How much of you, how do you, do you feel at all a sense of being in his shadow at all? Yeah. I mean, look, I think, uh, I always try to be open and honest about it on like, whether it's a podcast or talking to someone, or even if it's like advertised or whatever, it's like, yeah, look, my brother was helpful. He has a large online audience and I always mention it, but I will say one of the things that I've noticed more recently is like, now people are, some people I talk to probably about 50% are like, oh, I didn't know you had a brother. Right. So like, I think as you start to expand, a lot of that naturally kind of goes away. Um, and, and there's certainly people that look, there's plenty of people on the internet that will tell me, uh, I'm writing coattails and doing all these things and whatever, right. There's just like, there's haters everywhere. Like I was talking about earlier, but I just don't think about it. Right. It's kind of like, look, I put a lot, a lot, a lot of work into things that I do. Uh, and he's retweeted things and they've gotten 10 likes and then he's retweeted things and they've gotten 40,000 likes. So it's just really, it comes down to the content. Uh, and I know, uh, true to myself, like if you just put in the work and you continue to do this every day and you're good at it and you, you do the right things and you do it in the right way, um, it's going to happen regardless. And, and as long as you're open and honest and clear to people about kind of the advantages that you had, I think people respect it. Look, it's like, I didn't ask for all this stuff. It's kind of like, Hey, look, yeah, we're brothers, right? We, we kind of uh, work together on this stuff. But I think the one thing that's going to be helpful is like, it eventually just creates a network effect, right? Of like, Hey, look, I'm up to 250,000 now, right? And he's going to be at a million soon. And I'm going to be at a million eventually, right? And then maybe he'll be at two. And you start to look at how we can play off each other of him building businesses and me building businesses and working together on these things and retweeting things and sharing content and kind of just the flywheel of uh, each other's newsletters and YouTube channels and platforms and stuff. Um, so I think like for as much as, as, uh, as people are, you know, some people want to just discredit whatever you do, regardless if it's me or you or someone else, uh, based on something that they may find or think about or whatever. I think it always just comes back to like, if you're comfortable, uh, you know, admitting kind of the help that you had, everyone has help, right? Some more than others. And I'm certainly not naive to that, but I just think that uh, if you're comfortable admitting that and talking about it, and then you show that you put in the work, right? So like, I've had people come at me online before and other, and, and other people step in and like, Hey, look, dude, he did four to five threads for six months straight. And they take four to five hours each. Like, I don't see you doing that. And I always like, I don't interact with any of that stuff because it's kind of like whatever, but I think, uh, 
I, I've always thought about it personally. It's true, right? Like if you put in the work and, and all this stuff, then uh, you can certainly sleep well at night. Yeah, you've had advantages, but you certainly put in a, a great deal of work and it's so cool to see someone putting in work succeed. Um, where do you go to get away from it all? And when you get on Twitter and you start getting followers and you start getting retweeted and, and start talking to some of your heroes, you start being like, wow, this platform is amazing. And you start to get addicted to it in some way. I don't know if that's happened to you, but where do you step back and say, how do you step back and where do you go? And is there a place away from Twitter that you can just regroup and re rejuvenate? Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the things that I struggle with. And I know a lot of other people struggle with, which is really just like, one, as an entrepreneur and someone who creates content online all the time, uh, especially kind of in a position that I'm in where it's like, I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm not a reporter. So I don't like go chase sources and I do all these things, but I know that, um, you know, if breaking news comes out, I need to find it and I need to tweet it out or something like that. So I think that's something that I struggle with. Uh, but it's the same things I think a lot of other people do. So like my brothers and I, we, we fuck around. I have a girlfriend, we go to dinner. Uh, I was in pursuit. I worked out a lot before I started doing all this. So it was every single day, whatever. So like I've slowly started to pick up some of those habits again and start doing them. And I think those are all helpful, uh, especially the exercise portion, I think, right? Like, it's just like, it helps you take your mind off all this stuff. Um, but my brothers and I, we like to keep each other grounded, you know, make fun of each other, say you're not really that important, right? Same thing, the comments about the YouTube channel, right? Imagine uh, someone telling, you know, my brother who has 900,000 Twitter followers and, and 100 and something on YouTube and 100 and something on the newsletter. Hey, man, go back on YouTube, like, right? Like, it's just, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a joke, but it's just funny, right? And uh, I think those are like, you know, just important things to keep each other grounded. Um, obviously, uh, relationship with my girlfriend is important, family, friends, all that type of stuff. So I think it's just finding things like that, that, uh, you know, you can get offline for a little bit and, and relax and do all that type of stuff. But it's certainly harder to take a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I know that your brother joined the military while he was in college. And I'm curious what that felt like from your perspective as a younger brother. Were you worried, anxious, happy, proud? What, what was going through your mind when your, your brother joined the military? Yeah, I... Um... It's a good question. I think I was when I when he first went. I, I could. I'll have to send you a picture of it. It was it was hilarious. I looked like a ten year old. I was. Uh, I was just young, right? So, uh, I don't think I really understood the gravity of it necessarily. Like I understood what he was doing and that there was risk and all that type of stuff. And and you go through all the motions of uh, you know being sincere and catching up and talking and writing letters and all this stuff and. Uh, all that was certainly important, but I think looking back, I understand probably a lot more of the gravity of the situation now than I did previously. Um, but from a pride standpoint, yeah, hell yeah. Like, I think, uh, it was awesome, right? Like looking back, like it's, it's great. I, uh, I, it's, it's awesome. Right. I just think like to be able to go do that, um, he went to basic training when he was in high school, right? He graduated high school early in December, uh, went to basic training and said, look, this is something I want to go do. Um, so from just like a kind of understanding a vision and understanding what you want to do and having perspective on not only like your situation currently, but life in general uh, at that young age, it was certainly something that I admired as I got older, especially in high school and things like that and in college. And then as we get older now, um, I think it's like easy to forget sometimes, like not only myself, but other people and stuff. It's just like, because it was so many years ago now, um, but thinking back on it whenever we have conversations like this yeah certainly there is a uh, kind of an immense amount of uh, of pride and thankfulness and stuff like that um re relative like whatever people's feelings are on kind of the military and war and stuff like that i just think uh there's like kind of an ultimate respect for someone who at, especially at such a young age uh and especially when it's someone kind of within your family or your inner circle that goes and does it um i think yeah you certainly always respect that did you have any desire to join the military yourself after seeing your brother do it yeah, I did. Um, I thought about it. Certainly. Uh, I, I didn't do it. So I don't think it was something that like I wanted to do long term. And to be fair, I don't know if it was what he wanted to do long term. And I think once he was there and he realized it and all this kind of stuff, uh, the decision became easier. Um, but yeah, no, look, none of my other brothers did. So he was unique in that aspect. Um, but yeah, those those I think I think a lot of uh, people have that kind of thought process, at least early on, or at least uh, within my family, we all did. Um, but he was he was the one that went and took action on it. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. So go, we haven't spoke at all about sports or sports media so far. But I'm curious what where you think the opportunity is in the present day sports media landscape, and where you think the future of sports media is going to go? 
Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I feel like I could answer this in a million different ways, but uh, I think just on like the simplest perspective, I think we've seen, it's become obvious to everyone, right? Like people just care more about uh, personalities and kind of decentralized brands and individual brands uh, more than kind of these legacy uh, brands or institutions. And, and that's obviously been proven true in other categories like finance and general media and publications and stuff like that. Uh, but when you think about ESPN, right? Like ESPN has a million fantastic employees, great writers, people that I really admire and respect and all this kind of stuff. But it's just, I don't look at ESPN the same way that I did it when I was a kid. Right. So I always tell the story of when I grew up uh, with, with, you know, four brothers, my mom was the only girl in the house. And we had a, we had a female dog, which I always say, uh, but we, we didn't watch, uh, we didn't watch news, right? Like CNN, Fox news, none of that was ever on in our house. It was always ESPN, right? Always ESPN, whatever game was on, whatever channel was on, but it was always sports. And in particular, most of the time it was ESPN. So I think it's just changed and shifted. Like now you got a hundred thousand, 200,000 people watching Pat McAfee every day on YouTube. Right. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's wild numbers one, but two, it just wouldn't have even been possible back then. So I think like when you start to look at it in that kind of scope of like, Hey, 20 years first today, uh, there's obviously been a bunch of differences and I think it'll continue to change over time and, and, and individuals will continue to grow and be powerful and stuff like that. Um, so I think that's important from a media landscape. I'm trying to think like, um, what, if there's any other like macro themes I really believe in, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that what I said there is true for outside of sports media too, right? I think when you think about it from uh, kind of media in general, venture capital, uh, all that type of stuff, that the internet has shown that kind of the individual that puts himself out there and creates content and creates that brand or that awareness or that uh, kind of connection with the audience has uh, is kind of rewarded, right? And I think that's, that's true for most industries. You've mentioned Pat McAfee a couple of times, and I'm curious, what exactly do you admire about Pat McAfee? Uh, a lot. I think he is, uh, I don't know him personally. Um, I mean, we've like interacted a couple of times on Twitter and stuff, but I don't know him personally. But one of the things I really, he's, he's a unicorn when it comes to uh, uh, what he does for a living. And I mean, that is in everything from the kind of just the show uh, to his content, to his Twitter, everything. He's just one of a kind. I think he's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly talented. Um, I think he's probably one of the more talented people in sports media. Uh, and I think that he probably doesn't get enough credit for that. He's seen as kind of like a former NFL player that fucks around on the internet. And it's just not true. He's super, 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 super talented. And he's really good at what he does. Um, so I've always admired one, that and his work ethic too, which I think he worked extremely hard from what I can see. And then three, uh, he did it his own way. He said, you know, screw these guys. I'm not going to go work at these different places and whatever. I'm going to go build my own show. And he did it in his in Indiana, right? Like when everyone's running to New York, LA, Miami, whatever, he did it in Indiana. So I respect that. I just think, uh, like I said, I don't know him personally, uh, but I certainly respect him for sure. What advice would you have for someone who's a young kid? Let's say it's a college graduate, just trying to get started in sports media. What are the first few things you tell them to do? See, that's a, uh, I always have a tough time answering this question because sports is, it's an industry that's unique in the fact that I think it's probably one of the hardest industries to get into. And people outside of sports don't uh, accept that answer and they think it's a lie and they don't get it. But I think anyone who's ever tried to apply for jobs within sports or specifically sports agencies or big companies like ESPN and all these things, it's just extremely, extremely competitive. Uh, there's so many people that love sports at that age where you're leaving college and you're going and maybe there's people that are 45 now and they don't watch a single sports, but I'll tell you what, they probably watched when they were 20, right? So like, there's just a bunch of people who, even if they don't want to do this long-term, they think they do at the time. So the applicant pool is just massive. It's super competitive. If you don't know anyone in the space, it's really hard to get into. Uh, and that's honestly what led me to doing what I'm doing now, because I thought at first I wanted to be a sports agent. I was like, hey, this is awesome. You watch these movies. You're like, these guys are fucking cool. Uh, they get to hang out with the athletes. They do these big million dollar deals. They make all this money, all this stuff, right? And uh, I was certainly interested in that. And then you slowly realize, you're like, wait, these jobs are almost impossible to get. Like, you have to know someone. And then if you know someone, you're lucky enough to get in the mailroom for four years. Then you're a secretary for a few more years. And eventually, maybe you'll get a junior stuff. And then, you know, over time. And that's not to say it's not worth it, because it is for a lot of people, right? You put in the work and you make connections and, and, and you uh, kind of do your time. But it's just super, super, super competitive. So I think when someone's trying to get into the sports media industry, it's just hustling. You know, it's just figuring it out. It's figuring out what you're good at, your advantages, your connections, all that type of stuff, uh, and just going for it. And like, for me, 
my story is probably a little unique in the fact where like I had some advantages and stuff like that, but I knew, uh, you know, like you just got to go for it. You got to hustle. You got to go for it. Uh, no one's going to help you out unless you ask for it. Right. So when it comes to, uh, whether you're doing content online or whether you're looking to move careers or jobs or firms or agencies or whatever, uh, you got to ask people for help. You got to be willing to help other people. Uh, you got to work hard, obviously, like those are givens. Uh, and just be a good person. And, and I'm like a firm believer that a lot of that kind of when you combine those things together, it usually works out. Yeah. You mentioned that someone who's 45 was probably watching sports when they're 20. And I'm curious if that's something you're nervous about or have considered growing out of sports in general, especially covering it so much. And so often I know personally, I wrote a Knicks blog when I was 15 to 17. And by the time I was 17, I was like, I don't want to watch another Knicks game. I'm over this. But yeah. is that something you've considered or, or thought about? Are you, are you speaking about me personally or just the audience size? Yeah, you personally. Um, no, look, dude, I, I, I love this stuff. I think it's, uh, you know, and especially when you're in it every single day. I think generally when I talk about people that are 45 and might have like sports, people that went on and they had different careers, right? And they, they got, had kids and they got married and they don't have time and they're not watching games as intently. And over time, I think you just start to fall out of that scheme. And uh, it happens to everyone, right? Like I know people... Giants fans, right? So I'm a New York Giants fan. One of my Giants fans, buddies, he's he, he's been a Giants fan his whole life. He was watching every single, he's like fucking glued to the website, glued to the YouTube, glued to the Twitter, and he's watching every single update you can imagine, right? And it's like, uh, okay, when is Joe Judge speaking? I'm going to watch the whole press conference. I'm going to do this. And then you talk to him like a year later, and he's like, yeah, man, I got busy work. I haven't really had a chance to watch his <laughs> videos and stuff. And I think like that's a lot of the stuff that just compounds as you get older and you start to fall out a little bit. Uh, but from like a me personally perspective, like when you're in it every day and you love it and you do all this stuff, nah, I'm not concerned about it. Yeah. Have you got to the point where if people start talking to you outside of work, you, you're like, uh, I'm over this because I know one story is like Stephen A. Smith was working the finals nonstop and someone sees him at an airport and he's like, dude, I can't talk about this anymore. I spent 24 hours a day talking about this. Has that happened yet or? Yeah, I mean, look, I think uh, everyone, regardless if you're kind of uh, whatever your career is, if you're a banker, um, work in media, whatever, like you want to kind of have some sort of boundary of kind of what you do. Uh, I think when you're in a career like myself, where you're kind of doing this all day long and all this stuff, those boundaries kind of fade a little bit. Uh, so I wouldn't say that it's like some kind of strict, like, Hey, don't talk to me about this outside <laughs> of these hours. Uh, cause I talk about this stuff all day long, but I think I'm surrounded with enough people that are like, kind of, we just have a bunch of different interests and conversations and things like that. And I think it's helpful to have interests outside of what you're doing. Right. So I've always been kind of in tune with that of like, Hey, maybe we should go to a concert. Maybe we should do, you know, just like things that uh, keep you away from it for a little bit. But I'm uh, I'm lucky enough to where uh, Stephen A. Smith is at a different level of, of <laughs> fame where he gets recognized in the airport and uh, and, and all of that. And, and that's certainly tough in its own right. But I think uh, when those conversations come up, if it's, you know, for me, it's, it's something I love one, two, uh, I'm usually talking about it with a friend or a family member, a brother or a girlfriend or whatever. So it's kind of like, you know, these are conversations that I like having and they're fun and all that. So I don't, I don't really get too stressed about it. Where do you, do you see yourself as a talking head, a Stephen A. Smith type? Where, where do you see yourself 10 years down the line or 20 years down the line? Do you have any big goals or aspirations you want to put out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think it's continuing to just do what I'm doing and it's building businesses and it's investing in companies and it's creating content and all that type of stuff. Cause I think that those three or four things compound off each other and they create a really nice flywheel. Um, but yeah, I don't have any interest in being kind of a, a what I call a radio jockey of, of doing a, you know, two, three hours a day on, uh, on Sirius XM or something. I, I think, uh, there's, there's people that love that and there's people that are really good at it. Um, but for me, it's like knowing that I'm not great at that and then just focusing on the things that I am good at. And you're definitely good at writing the newsletter and writing threads. That's <laughs> proven. Is there anything else you'd like to mention before we go to a close? No, man. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, uh, I'm glad we got to do this. It's been a fun conversation. Uh, and I'm happy you invited me. Hell yeah, man. Where can people find more from you? Uh, easiest way is just Twitter. If you go to my Twitter, um, the newsletter links up there. So it's, uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier, I think, but it's Monday through Friday, sports business topic, one topic a day. It's usually five minute read or less. It's free. Um, so that's kind of like the 22nd little, little <laughs> pitch, but if you go to my Twitter, all the links are there. You'll, you'll see it. You can follow me there. And I, I put out content on there all day. So, uh, that's probably the easiest place. 
Awesome. And I'll put it below so people can click on it right away and real easy. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, Danny.